And so that's the birth story. I've never been able to convince John and Paul to revise their story because it's just so perfect a story the way they tell it. Uh, so that's how uh, Grand Strategy got started. Um, and now I think, if I'm right, we have our first briefing. Are you ready? A staff ride is a teaching technique that the U.S. Army has used now for many, many years. Uh, they adopted it from the Prussian Army. And the birth story of staff rides, I don't know, it might be apocryphal, but the birth story is that, that the Prussian uh, military developed it trying to make sense of why they kept losing in the Napoleonic Wars, why, why Napoleon did so well and, uh, and outgeneraled uh, their uh, officers. And the idea was that one of Napoleon's great strengths was something that Clausewitz called coup d'oeil, the capacity to see the battlefield all at once and to see the interaction of terrain and tactics, the, the use of logistics and the advantage that fast logistics would bring you, um, all, see it all in a moment. And something that you can't get if you're just watching it or studying it in a classroom, you have to actually be on the field. And so the Prussians would take their officers and walk through, ride through uh, the great battles uh, with different officers playing the role of different key decision makers. They had researched what the, that person did, their background, why they made the decision they did. And as you got to different places on the battlefield, you would give a first person interview. I was presenting as Secretary of War Newton Baker as well as the Red Baron, who was a German fighter pilot who was used for propaganda purposes throughout the war effort. Explaining what you did. My name is Georges Palma. I was a French codebreaker during World War I. Answering questions about the choices you made and as the different pieces come together in a um, mosaic kind of way, you gradually get a picture. And, and infantrymen ready with bayonets to stick anybody trying to climb over the top. Uh, the second and third trenches usually had machine guns and other supplies and... So one was Philippe Patin, who was the French commander-in-chief. And on the other hand, I played uh, a tunneler in the British Army Corps. We matched each person with a historical character that they could accurately represent in terms of both their interests and their strengths as speakers. For example, one student, Matthew King, who has always had a strong interest in literature and poetry, was assigned the role of Wilfred Owen, one of World War II's best-known war poets. To Wilfred Owen, have you seen the front? It is not as it used, not, to, not be. As it used to be. Larks sing. Shells rust, fevers cool. The winter of the world is in tacit armistice with spring. Living waters pool in tired foxholes. Proud young forests sit in no man's land. Ants go marching in platoons. Mine sunk craters yield to ponds where smitten turtles sun themselves on balmy afternoons. Only the mud is as it was, partout. It clings to every soul. But certain fields block the charging sludge. In them, marble shields. Or are they dragon's teeth? Mark you, guard you from the mire. You rest, your daggers sheathed. And yet, how swiftly nature heals, how slowly men forget. But I wanted students to understand the scale of the horror that was World War I and why those who fought it thought that it could only be morally justified if it was the war that ended all wars. There were few experiences that parallel walking through fields of memorials and the battlefields going through the trenches themselves to make you realize your position when it comes to war and the conditions through which war can be deemed necessary. I remember being at the site of one of the memorials and just looking over this field in this Belgium countryside and thinking, how can this generation of of Europeans, of Belgians, ever recover from having almost a lost generation entirely under 
what condition of humanity can we allow this to, to continue? And in conversations with my peers on the staff ride afterwards and just relating it to the kind of current state of world affairs and the conflicts that are rife in this world. I think staff ride experiences, looking back at history and some of the worst atrocities that have ever been committed, um, solidifies like my passion for working to prevent, to prevent war, to pursue peace and make sure that all facets of diplomacy are exhausted before we ever think about engaging in the use of arms. One of my students said, I knew we'd be studying World War I. I didn't realize we'd be experiencing World War I. But of course, that's part of the magic of a staff ride. It gives, it strains people, takes them out of their physical comfort zone, presses them a little bit. In no way did we approximate the horror of actual soldiers uh, serving at that time. At the same time, just being able to walk through trenches in the rain, to duck down and go into the tunnels, and to feel and smell the air, even to find uh, small pieces of cartridge, some spent, some even live cartridges still from the battle a hundred years earlier. That brings it to life in a way that I could not accomplish just in a seminar classroom. Welcome, I am so glad to have you all here. Um, I have worked with and uh, sparred with your <laughs> esteemed professor. There's lots of teaching lessons in a staff ride, some of them directly concerning the battle or campaign you're studying, and some are bigger life lessons. And our very first meeting was also our most important from a protocol meeting. We were hosted by Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchinson, U.S. Ambassador to NATO. She hosted us in the Truman House, the uh, Ambassador's residence. It's a very fine home. It's, of course, a great honor to be hosted by the U.S. Ambassador. And our team had to get its act together and get itself in shape after spending the night not sleeping on the airplane. So we changed uh, clothes in the bathroom at the airport. We uh, put water through our hair, tied, put ties on our, around our necks, and, and took off. And of course, the alumni who were on the trip said, if you want to know what it's like to be a consultant, who travels the world and has a business consultant, this is what they do. They take red eyes, they change in the bathroom, and then they have a meeting first thing, and they have to just perform at a high level. I was very proud of our students that they, they did that well. And so we have uh, out there, we have a young Adolf Hitler, we have a pompous Lloyd George, we have an arrogant Clemenceau, and and generals and, and corporals and everything in between. I see, so everybody's playing a part. Absolutely. We even have uh, Gavrilo Princip, who uh, started the whole war. So <laughs> I have two wonderful staffers, our military guys, um, and I told them this morning that they were in charge of World War I history, and I would take care of what's happening today in NATO. So you will meet uh, Colonel Dirk Driggers and Colonel Jim Golby. And um, they are both just great, great staff people uh, at NATO. Uh, they're both active duty military, and they are advisors to me. I've gone to Afghanistan now twice with Jim Golby. In, 19, in August 1914, I took my theories to the battlefield for myself. And so he offered some very valuable insight. Um, and the same goes for Dr. John Hillen, who's a Duke alum, former Assistant Secretary of State. A great relationship I was able to build through the European staff ride was with Professor John Hillen, who's also a Duke alum. He joined us for the staff ride and engaged with us in several conversations about leadership um, and how that might translate beyond the just the public sector in the context of war, but into the private sector. Who's got time for a big Marxist <laughs> dialectic? I could, go on, I could go on for a long time here. Stormtroopers, Zeppelins in the Navy, precision artillery, dismounted cavalry, yada yada. One of the great things you can learn from history is the way in which the thinking process unfolded from the people in charge. Why did they decide to do what they did? So by role playing with characters and deeply studying the characters that we do on the staff rides and going to the very locations where under stressful circumstances they had to make the decisions they did and debating back and forth with people playing differing parties at the time. We get empathy for other points of view. 
we get an understanding of the critical issues at hand and ultimately begin to understand why people, especially people in leadership positions, make the decisions that they do. All this is unveiled on the staff ride in a fun, historical form. Something about traveling together with a group of people for a week, sitting on the bus together, eating dinner together, exploring together, um, leads to a much closer and more conversational dynamic. And so whether it's bearing through the rain and the mud and slipping and falling, or walking the streets of the Champs-Élysées at night, um, you really just build these special relationships with the faculty and your peers that, that definitely will last a lifetime. I'm really proud of how far we've come, but I'm really energized by how far we have yet to go.